Very good. Well, um, it is three o'clock in London and equivalent times elsewhere around the globe. So um, I think we will make a start. Um, welcome very much everybody to uh, this in the first of a series of lectures organized by the International Association for Archaeological Research in Western and Central Africa. Um, this is part of a Archaeology in Action series, and um, we have a, a lineup over the coming weeks um, throughout May and June of some uh, wonderful titles by distinguished speakers. Um, and very much, uh, I know, looking at everyone who's in the audience here, um, uh, good friends. So it's terrific to have you all um, with us today for the first of these talks. Um, I should just mention up front that if you could um, keep your microphone muted and uh, your camera off initially, please. And then of course, um, we will have our talk, but plenty of time afterwards, plenty of opportunities afterwards for questions and comments. Um, if you prefer to um, leave a comment in the chat box, um, do, do type that in and I can pick that up at the end as well. But otherwise, as I say, there'll be plenty of time for talking afterwards. So I want to leave uh, the screen really for our speaker. Um, so um, I'm delighted to welcome as our, as our first speaker in, in um, this series of talks, uh, Dr. Amy Gamsell, who's currently Associate Professor of Art History at St. John's University in New York City. There she teaches courses on ancient Islamic and A Asian art, and she serves as the advisor for undergraduate art history, and she also directs the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies program. Uh, Amy earned her doctorate in ancient Near East Islam from Harvard University in 2008, and from 2008 to 2010, she served as the US Department of State as the Associate Coordinator for Iraqi and Afghan Cultural Heritage, working on projects to restore and build professional capacity at the Afghan National Museum, the National Museum of Iraq, and the site of Babylon in Iraq. She has enormous archeological experience at sites around the globe, ranging from the US through Syria and Turkey, she was previously a postdoctoral fellow at Emory University, um, Bill and Carol Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry. And she's been awarded two grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities and one from the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq. Her scholarly essays, of course, are numerous, as you will, I'm sure, all know. And you also recognize her two edited books, Cyber Research on the Ancient Near East and Neighboring Regions, published in 2018 by Brill, and Testing the Canon of Ancient Near Eastern Art and Archaeology by Oxford University Press in 2020. She is in the midst of finishing uh, a next eagerly awaited book, with a, a preliminary title of The Queens of Nimrud's Northwest Palace, Beauty, Power and Presence in the Neo-Assyrian World. And of course, we do uh, await that, but we're perhaps giving something of a little preview here today, um, as she will be talking on an aspect of um, queenly attire uh, with a lecture entitled The Crown of City Walls and Neo-Assyrian Queenship. Amy, thank you so much uh, for um, delivering this talk today, and we all look forward to hearing it. Thank you. Please go ahead. Hello, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for taking the time out of your day. And um, thank you for your interest. I also have a, a welcome and a thank you here from um, an Assyrian queen. I just think it's it's so important that we do our best um, to find 
their stories and to, to find who they were um, and bring that into the kind of course of history. Um, so these women can eventually sit as, as they did in antiquity um, in partnership with the kings, not kind of um, in tiny broken pieces that they have been kind of cast aside through in scholarship. So thank you again for your interest and thanks to Paul and for Arwa for um, supporting this endeavor. So the crown of city walls and Neo-Assyrian kingship, queenship, my goodness. <laughs> so in my presentation today, I am really working through a lot of ideas um, and it's almost, it's preliminary in a way. This is research that I have been playing with for years. Um, and every time the, the mural crown comes up, I, I feel like I have another piece of the puzzle, but I don't yet know how to reconstruct that full puzzle. So I, I'm starting to bring some of the evidence together here. And, and I hope that you'll join me in puzzling through it and um, hopefully, um, you know, sharing your perspectives and um, adding perhaps a few pieces. So I've organized my talk into four sections today. They're not all of equal length, but I think because it's a relatively long presentation, just so that you kind of know where we're going as we're making progress through, um, these are the four kind of segments of it. Um, we're going to begin with the iconography of the Neo-Assyrian queen and the mural crown. And then I'll be queuing each new segment as we move through them throughout the course of the presentation. And with that, we have the crown of city walls, the also known as the mural crown. And in this talk, um, as an art historian, I'm really looking at and emphasizing the visual evidence. That's, this is our starting point. I'm also drawing upon archeological evidence, which you will see is really an evidence of absence, but that's something that we do need to address. And most of my research is based here in the Neo-Assyrian period, but we're going to be moving outside the boundaries of that as well, as we really, I'm, I'm seeking clues um, in, you know, as broadly as, as they might be available here. So in terms of the visual evidence, I'm focusing um, primarily on iconography and iconography of queenship and the role of the crown in queenship. We have to understand that in order to understand this crown in general, I think. Um, what I have only began to kind of dip into is the textual evidence. And I know there are some Assyriologists here today, and that is kind of a next phase of, of research that I hope to bring in kind of with a fine tooth comb and see how that can also illuminate our data that we're getting from the visual record primarily here. So I also want to remind us that queen in Akkadian, mi a gal, it's woman of the palace. So when we see a queen, like we're looking at here, with the crown of city walls on, we want to conceptualize her as the woman of the palace. So perhaps she is really the embodiment of, of the palace. She is sitting at the core of the empire in the palace, the palace is within the citadel, which is within the city walls of the capital. So she's highly protected, but at the same time, she's almost perhaps something like a personification of empire, um, dressed in the glory of empire with this crown on her head. So if we can, you know, kind of think about it big picture in that sense. It's not just a marker of queenship, but this is a marker of empire and her identity as an agent of the empire. So looking across these three very well-known artworks that depict the mural crown, the first question that I feel that I need to resolve is are these figures queens? Before we can talk about the queen wearing the crown of city walls, let's try to, you know, confirm that we are indeed looking at queens wearing them. And the reason that, that I bring this up is that there has been, there's scholarship that has questioned the identity of these figures. And that kind of throws the whole, you know, question out of the queen and this 
crown if these are not images of the queen, but I strongly believe that they are. So I just want to um, kind of take you through the iconographic confirmation of that. So the first image that is of significance is this one in the center. It's Queen Labali Sharat. This is from her stele found um, at Ashur. And in 2008, so this should um, dispel some of the earlier concerns, in two, uh, 2018, that is, um, a join was found. This stele always had a fragment assumed to be associated with it that was inscribed. Image of Labali Sharat, Queen of Ashurbanipal, King of the Universe, King of Assyria. But there was not a known join where that piece connected to the stele. And here, it's very hard to see in this photo, but this is the crown here and the queen with her hand up. With this inscription now um, being confirmed to join, we have an image attached to which is essentially a label telling us, yes, this is indeed the queen. So if we go back to these images. Okay, that is indeed Labali Sharat. Here we have, this is from the garden party banquet scene. They are celebrating she and Ashurbanipal, whose reign we know, whose date of the um, victory against the Elamites is known. She is known to have been his wife since the time that he was a crown prince. There's no evidence that she died during his reign. So if this is on her steely Labali Sharat as queen with that crown on here, we must have her again as queen. Both of these figures too are sitting on a throne and the throne, it's not just, it's a high back chair here, but it has a sash over the back of it. That's another indicator that this isn't just a chair, but this is a royal throne. You, you know, obviously the posture is very similar here then. We don't have Labali Sharat, but we have the inscribed bronze revetment that is labeled image of Nakia. It doesn't give her title, but in that time period, this is likely showing her with Esarhaddon. She was serving, um, as Sana Svard's research has demonstrated, she was serving in the capacity of queen. Being queen mother, she was serving as queen, carrying out the duties of queenship, wearing the regalia of queenship. So we have here, I think, a secure representation of a queen in that crown of city walls. So another aspect of the iconography that I think might be relevant to interpreting the significance of this crown is that in my research on the iconography of queenship, I was looking at context as well. And here we have a narrative context where the queen or the figure in question, whether it's the queen or not, is shown as the partner of the king. You also have these imperial figures in a sacral setting at the banquet or actively engaged in ritual on the bronze. And then back on the banquet scene, they're the subject of attention by attendants. So yes, these are queens wearing mural crowns. And the mural crown is a key part of the iconography of queenship in the seventh century BC. It's the seventh century. This is the Sargonid dynasty. So I wanna go back up here and kind of break down this iconography of queenship because it's going to become significant. So in being queen, I've kind of come up with what I, I call um, a multi-sectional identity and iconography for queenship. And part of that is just being female. Some of the questions about who are these figures is are they eunuch figures or is this a female? It has to be a female to be the queen. So we see uh, the femininity, the beardlessness, but that could be a eunuch as well. The sloped chest, oops, the sloping of the chest um, is an indication, it seems, of a bust line of femininity of breasts that are present. So that's another kind of indicator that we have queens. The state affiliation and the status, these are obviously royal Assyrian figures. We can recognize that from the garments, from the handheld objects, from the types of jewelry that they wear. They're also mortal beings. It's important that we're able to discern when are we looking at a goddess and a divine crown versus a queen and a royal crown. So we kind of establish the identity and the iconography of queenship here, but these are seventh century Sargonid examples, but we're establishing that identity through these 
figures, as well as through these multiple facets that are coming up in texts like the me a gal, it's the woman of the palace. So we want to look for femininity in all of their inscriptions. It's the queen of a particular king. It's giving that Assyrian royal status. There's never a divine determinative. So these are absolutely mortal women that we're looking at. So we then have, and you know, I, I, I bring up questions because not everything fits. This is why the puzzle is a challenge that we work for decades together and collaborate on attempting to solve, knowing that we still might not be able to explain everything. But along with those three images that I just showed you, we then have a corpus of glyptic imagery of seal. Um, this is a carved chalcedony seal in the British Museum and several impressions. We also have some impressions from the site of Asher that are in the VAM. In these images, we have, again, it's a ritual scene. They're very small scale, but still they're um, detailed enough that we can see that there's some kind of headdress on the queen. Another indicator of the queenship is the scorpion. So I call that the, a visual context. Also the guillotine, it's telling us this is a royal scene. The chalcedony seal is very well preserved. Um, some of you might have um, seen it in person. This drawing by Nider Writer, then he examined the seal in person and I've, I've communicated with him. He said he absolutely could clearly see the definition of a crown of city walls on this queen figure. So in his drawing here, which is very clear, we have what has got to be a crown of city walls. But the reason I bring these seal fig um, figures up is because they also incorporate quite consistently when it's preserved, these are impressions. So they're not all fully impressed, but when it is preserved fully, some kind of cap like top perhaps, and a little spike sticking out of it. It's consistently showing up. And these are impressions from different seals. So there's some intention here. You can see it in this kind of blown up impression. There's definitely something there. And look, of course, we recognize this from the top of the King's Fez. You know, there's questions. What is that? Is it a military helmet that he has underneath that's wrapped? Is it part of the, the hat itself? Is this some kind of composite headdress? Because we also know he's um, sometimes he's wrapping a diadem around the outside of this Fez. So this crown of city walls, is it possible? And for this, I don't I don't have the answer. Is it possible that it's being worn on top of some kind of other headdress? Or is it a, an addition? Is, is it part of a more elaborate version of that crown of city walls that we see only um, in the open version in the relief carvings? So something is going on here. The reason, again, that I, I pointed to the, the ritual aspect, Nakia is shown in a ritual that was probably you know, something very much like what we're seeing in these seal impressions approaching a deity. So she has the open crown of city walls on, but were there particular rituals in which one would wear a different version of that crown or put the crown of city walls on, on top of or around some other underlying crown? So maybe we see some kind of composite being necessary for a particular ritual context here. So we're going to Think about now earlier mural crowns. Could there be a continuity of mural crowns? The reason this came to me as a, a possibility, I wasn't actually looking, I wasn't researching the mural crown per se. I was researching the iconography of queenship. And what I found is that there are few examples of pre sargonid images of queens. In those images, we do not seem to, and, and we'll get to that in a moment, we do not seem to have any definition of the royal mural crown. So these queens, okay, pre sargonid queens, it was always kind of the simple explanation. The mural crown is associated with the Sargonid dynasty. It, it comes into play for these later queens, but where does it come from is one question. 
And my question, when I started looking at the iconography of the queens, the pre-Sargonid queens and the Sargonid queens, they actually have a lot in common from that multi-sectional perspective, the royal Assyrian female mortal image with a rank of queen. The thing that's different is how the rank of queen perhaps is shown. But we might not be seen. We only have four examples of pre-Sargonid Neo-Assyrian queen images. So we might not be seeing the entire range. And there's one seal I'm going to get to that we can't, it's a seal impression. We can't really tell what's being worn on the head. So that might be an earlier iteration of this crown. So we're going to get to that. Here we have possible 8th century, but dated to the reign of Sargon, possible example of a queen wearing a mural crown. This is a very, um, it's, it's pretty poorly preserved, but it's um, very poorly published. The actual seal impression, and there are four of these, this is the best one with the best image that I was able to find. Um, it's from CTN2 um, from the 1970s. The, seals them, the ceilings themselves are in Iraq, so hopefully somebody could inspect them at some point again in the future and rephotograph them. But for now, what we have is an image of two deities that are mounted here, a god and goddess. We have the king, the hand up, and we have a queen figure. And what does she have on her head? There's also, it seems to be a scorpion that's present here. The format resembles very much what we see in those later seals that are probably dating to the reign of Sennacherib and later. So this might be an example. It's definitely dating to the time of Sargon because of the text that it's associated with, um, probably around 716. This could be an example where the mural crown is being rolled out in the iconography. So I'm very curious to eventually be able to see that seal. Then, as I was looking into earlier examples of queens, I came upon a Middle Assyrian seal with something that in the drawing could be a mural crown. It could be a feather topped crown. However, the enthroned figure is identified as a queen based on the towel that's being offered to her. And this would be a backless throne. You have a footstool here. The mirror is another indicator that we have a queen. So these are kind of towel and mirror scenes as they are described. So if this is a queen, she would, here you see a goddess with a you know, feather-topped crown. If this is a queen, she is not wearing a goddess crown. She would be wearing a mortal crown. Perhaps this is then an earlier example of the crown of city walls. Also going on here is this long hair, is this part of diadem that's wrapped around it with the dorsal banner that you see. Also, you have that showing up on divine figures, but usually it's thicker and kind of beaded when it's in association with the crown. This is a Neo-Assyrian example, but to try to find the continuity, we um, might be even dealing with a situation where the, the iconography is still in flux. Um, it, it's not, you know, here we have the crown being represented in a way that is not yet fully articulated and consistent and that can develop into different types of crowns that are more um, carefully articulated um, as very specific iconography in the Neo-Assyrian period. So this is just a possibility. Then going much deeper, a mural crown, much more likely looking mural crown on an Akkadian seal dated to the reign, probably late in the reign of Naram Sin. Here you have a figure, um, probably an end priestess um, and a royal daughter, a daughter of Naram Sin, who seems to be wearing, um, as she sits enthroned, a mural crown. It has an inscription that identifies the owner of the seal, presumably, as the daughter of Niram Sin. There is, of course, the question, 
No, we don't know what this is, or I don't know what this is that she's being offered as the attendant is approaching. Is it possible that this is a divine figure? It doesn't necessarily have to be an image of the person who is named in the inscription. So it could be um, a goddess figure, or it could be a royal mortal female figure. In any case, could this be because iconographically, again, it's not exactly the same as what we see in the Neo-Assyrian period. But could this be the earliest example that we have of a mural crown? So if these are much earlier examples of an iconography of a mural crown being worn either um, by a queen or going all the way back into the Akkadian time, a royal mortal female. Do we have some kind of continuity? Is there an unbroken tradition of wearing this more mural crown that extends through the Neo Assyrian period? If not, was there a continuity from the Akkadian into the Middle Assyrian period that then was paused and revived by the Neo-Assyrian Sargonids, maybe Sargon himself? Or did the crowns that we're seeing here not relate to this later tradition of the mural crown? Um, they could still be some kind of precedent that eventually inspired the image and iconography of the mural crown, but not necessarily directly related in a lineage where it is um, continued as the exact same type of crown. And when we have these crowns in imagery, we would want to know, you know, are they also wearing them in person? Where are these crowns? Who is seeing these crowns? So I'm going to move into introducing some of the archaeological evidence. I do want to reiterate one other thing. So the Sargonids, and um, we'll touch on this again later, but they were looking back to the Akkadian period. So could they be aware of, could they be reviving something intentionally? Or, you know, again, would they have been cut off from this tradition? Would it, would it have been unknown to them? So we go to the archeological record now, headdresses and the absence of mural crowns in the queen's tombs at Nimrud. And in so much of my research on the queen's tombs at Nimrud, I have um, been confronted with the question, you know, were there no mural crowns? Why were there no mural crowns? And I, I've never had a definitive answer. One of the things I have always suggested is that, well, perhaps there, if there was a mural crown in this time period, the crown of city walls would have been the crown of queenship. Perhaps it, there would have been only one and it was passed down through the generations. It was not taken to the grave, having a new one created. We know that graves are robbed, even though they're secure in the palace, you may not be the best place to put the crown of queenship. The other thing is that if it's possibly, if it's a very specific crown of state, it could even be ancient that has been passed down for centuries before it even gets to the Neo-Assyrian period. That crown is an object, it's, is a ritual object itself at that point. And that crown is singular. Um, it can't be recreated. So perhaps in that case, we would have only one crown that we're dealing with. So when we go into Nimrud's Northwest Palace Queen's Tombs. We're going into um, material deriving from the 800s and 700s. So this is just a reminder of the Northwest Palace. The tombs were found beneath the floor. Um, tombs two and three contained objects that were inscribed naming particular queens. Um, a coffin from tomb three named Queen Hama. And inside tomb two, 
were objects referring to Queen Yaba and Queen Benitu, likely the same person. I call her Yaba Benitu and also Queen Atalia. Tomb one was empty, but the inscription there indicates that it belonged to the first queen of the Northwest Palace, the Queen of Ashurnasirpol II. So we absolutely have a, a context of queens here. So what we are finding buried with their bodies, those objects would be things that presumably they were, that were part of their identity, that were necessary to be buried with them so that they could carry on into the afterlife or return as ghosts perhaps to the palace um, as themselves and maintain their identity. And they had to maintain their queenship as they carried on into these other forms of being beyond the mortal body. And with that, I believe they're taking these crowns, these headdresses, these aspects of their identity. But here we have the crown from Queen Hama's burial. Doesn't It's not a mural crown. The crowns from tomb too, from Yaba Benitu and Atalia. Again, not a mural crown. And I could um, go into the possible iconography and the significance of the individual, all of these individual headdresses here, but I'm going to focus on just one of them. I will say though, that the example that was found with Queen Hama here on with the purple background reminds me of when we were looking at those seals and, I, the, and the impressions. And I said, it looks like you have a crown of city walls with a cap like something on top of it. And then something like a spike poking out. Well, this model that we see here in Queen Hama's headdress, while it's not a crown of city walls, it's a crown of fruits and flowers, it could be a model for how a crown of city walls was configured so that you could have the city walls going across here and then some kind of open work with a cap like top uh, on top of which you could have had that spiky thing. If that is the case though, it conflicts with my theory that there was one crown of city walls that was being passed down because why, um, for example, is Labali Sharat and Nakia, are they depicted with that open mural crown if there's just one crown and then the women, the queen figures on those seals have this slightly different version that has a cap like top and a spike on it. So there is a possibility that there were different versions of the mural crown, or again, that it was a composite where the crown itself would be more like what we see here in this model, um, the diadem of rosettes that was found with Yaba Benitu. If that were kind of the form that the mural crown was taking, you could imagine it could be slipped over top or worn as kind of a bottom layer a, below another headdress that was standing up above it. And this, it's hard to tell in this picture, but it's actually somewhat flexible. Um, like you get the sense with this diadem that's made of the, the gold weave down here. Um, this floral circlet is also somewhat flexible. So it's possible. I always assume the crown of city walls is very rigid. We see in a, in a relief, for example, carrying um, kind of the models of a city. The um, It seems like it's a hard, rigid object. But perhaps the, the physical form that it took when it was being worn was this more flexible type that could be slid down over top of another type of headdress, which would bring us back to the possibility that there could just be one crown of city walls. So anyway, we are going to focus now on the diadem with the dorsal band. I have previously published that I believe that this is the diadem of neo-Assyrian queenship. Perhaps um, it served to represent queenship um, in totality on its own in the absence of a mural crown during that pre-Sargonid period. We have this example from tomb two. It's the only intact, fully intact version of this type of headdress. It's made of gold. We'll come back to that in a second. We do have, this is one of the examples of an image of a queen from that pre-Sargonid period. In fact, 
This is the seal of Hama that was found in her tomb. It has, um, it's inscribed um, and identifies her in the inscription here, it has an image of what has got to be a queen figure approaching a deity. It has the image of a, the visual context here of a scorpion motif. It has the guillotine around it. This was found on her body. It's solid gold. It's like really quite large for a stamp seal. So all of these indicators suggest that we are in fact looking at an image of a queen. Here she is in ritual with some kind of band around her head and probably connected a dorsal ribbon going down her back. So that would match with the type of headdress that you see here. But this headdress was found with Gabo Benitu and Italia. This is depicted on a seal found with Hama. So we start to see that multiple queens are wearing this type of diadem. But this is not just the diadem of the queen. This is a diadem of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. So the king is also shown. Um, this is Ashurbanipal from um, the, the banquet scene that we saw. He's also shown wearing it. The crown prince is shown wearing it. It is a, head, a headdress that distinguishes rank, but in the case of the queen wearing it and the crown prince wearing it, it differentiates them from the king. When the king is wearing it, the queen is differentiated from the king again in the case of the garden relief because she has the crown of city walls on. I don't think we would ever see two figures that are both wearing this diadem at the same time that could cause any ambiguity as to which one is the king or which one is the queen. So going back to the intact that I have just as a reminder down here in the corner, this intact diadem with a dorsal band, then we see it on the seal that has Hama's name on it. When we do look more closely at the items in her burial, we find that there are these segments probably segments from a disintegrated. It's the same kind of these frontal plaques um, with the pendants that would dangle over the forehead here. You can even see um, they would have been hinged together. These two are meeting. So maybe there are multiple of these diadems with dorsal bands included in Queen Hama's burial. What the rest of the material was, uh, it could have been woven, it could have been of, uh, of felt, it could have been of leather, it could have been of some other material that disintegrated. There is no evidence that these of any other physical remains in the burial to what these attach to. So I, I believe it was some kind of organic material that disintegrated, but that this is strong evidence that she was herself buried with probably a few headdresses such as this. So this would be that um, showing her showing her queenship, carrying it through in death, but it's not a mural crown. Now, whoa, when we keep looking, going back to tomb two, in that burial where we have the intact example with Queen Yaba Benitu and Italia, we also have a whole bunch of fragments that again could have been attached to other examples of this type of diadem. So maybe they had a wardrobe of these diadems. Maybe each queen had a had a few for, for different um, occasions. They're made of different materials, as you see with the, the tree imagery too. Maybe the, the iconography differs. There's certainly missing iconography on these. So maybe there were different uses for different versions of these diadems with a dorsal band. Um, and these would match the type of ornament that is at the very bottom. These are also possibly associated with some version of a headdress like this. So if all these queens from Nimrud, these pre-Sargonid queens are buried with this type of headdress, what about the mural crown? And I'll also point out Atalia, the last queen, that is Sargon's queen, Sargon's spouse. Sargon's reign, is the beginning of when we first saw that stamp seal that had the same format of king and queen in ritual, where the later more pre better preserved examples show us that version of a mural crown. So there's evidence that at least by her reign, possibly we're moving into a mural crown. So when I did a simulation um, for the uh, AJA publication of what a queen might have looked like wearing um, 
the imperial crown of queenship, I chose to use the diadem with the dorsal band, as you see here. Since no mural crown was found with the regalia in the tombs, we've always assumed they didn't have it. But what if they did? What if at least Atalia's um, Sargon's queen did? What would that have looked like? So I just happened to have found this is um, a Spanish designer who was kind of playing around and putting this jewelry and materials found in the Nimrud tombs together with um, a totally um, imaginary version of this crown of city walls. But I think this is useful to see um, because it gives us an example of the gold crown. It even suggests perhaps it could have been segmented in a way that would have been flexible to fit over different heads, hairstyles, and possibly composited with other types of headdress. So this is just as a teaser. So the case of Egyptian crowns and the case of the last Neo-Assyrian mural crown. So I'm, instead of drawing the evidence together and having a neat package to give you a, a, a definitive conclusion with, I am um, kind of bringing in further ideas that might further stimulate us to help to kind of, again, put this puzzle together to solve the case. So the case of the Egyptian crowns, this occurred to me, it, it like hit me like a truck when I was watching a presentation about the adornment of King Tutankhamun. And of course, the diadem that he was buried with, I had never really thought about how it is similar in, in some ways to the Neo-Assyrian diadem. I am not suggesting that there's any connection with Egypt in these diadems. There could be, but that's not the thread of my research here. That's not where I'm going. I'm using this as a model. I'm showing you how this diadem led me to think of something that might make it more obvious why we don't have a crown of city walls in the tombs. So this diadem was found on his mummified head. It's known as a cap crown. It had a skull cap underneath it, which had decayed. So this would have been worn directly on the king's head. This is what he was buried with. This was that imperial identity that was being carried forth into the afterlife. No state crown, hello, of upper or lower Egypt has ever been found. Why are they not in the tombs? Um, I had just never made the connection that the official royal headdress, the uber headdresses of ancient Egyptian pharaohs, when we have tombs, that they're not there. So that is evidence that that, that crown, that coronation crown perhaps, is what is being passed down. Um, but then there's a royal diadem that the individual actor who serves in that role of monarch wears. This is their royal diadem, but it's not the state crown. It's not the coronation crown. So this might explain the diversity of headdresses that we have in the Nimru tombs. None of them were the official state crown that could have been that crown of city walls. And when we have that diadem, this headdress that we found evidence in in multiple tombs, that could be that's a marker of participation in the imperial household at the very top ranks of queen, crown prince, and king. But it is not the official state crown. So that's where the Egypt piece of the puzzle came in. And I'd also like to mention when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about where, where would that official crown of city walls have been stored? I mean, I, my research is on the Northwest Palace, so I, I think there's a possibility of um, ritual spaces in the palace where perhaps the king's crown and the queen's crown could have been stored. You'd have to keep them extremely secure from malevolence and from enemies, from, from any potential um, risk 
or anybody who could parade as king or queen. So that's another reason, again, you wouldn't want to put them in the tomb if it's just one. You keep it in this very special place and it is worn for very particular occasions. So where did the crown of mural walls go? That Neo-Syrian crown that, you know, we, we last saw it on the Bale Sharat's head, on her stele and on the banquet relief. But what happened to it then? It, it disappears from the iconography because the iconography of Neo-Assyrian queens disappears. What happened to the crown? And we don't have burials of later queens, but was the crown preserved? Might it have last been actually seen, the physical crown of city walls of Neo-Assyrian queenship? Might it have last been seen in Babylon at Adad Gupi's funeral? So that's you know, woman who's identified as the daughter of Ashurbanipal, who lived a very, very long life, um, legendary or, or, or truly long life, um, apparently dying in 544 BC in Babylon as the queen mother of Nabonidus, king of Babylon. So this is a translation. It's a recent translation from 2018 by Halton and Svard. It's not the universal translation, um, but it it is a translation describing the funeral of Adad Gupi. And it says here, laid out her dead body for burial and fine clothes, bright linen, a golden mural crown, fine stones, choice stones, etc. So might that crown have finally been buried? Might the Assyrian Empire have finally been buried seriously with the body of Adagupi. This is a possibility, a possibility. Or did it survive? Now I'm really going out on a limb here, but I, I can't help but speculate. Did it possibly survive in Babylon as a relic or as spoils? It would be very precious. It would be, we don't know even how ancient it was by the time it might have gotten to Babylon. And if it did survive, might Alexander the Great's army or the Seleucid rulers later take inspiration from it? Might they have seen it? So we have the crown of city walls entering a Hellenistic iconography through Greek and Western Asian contact. We know they were in Babylon. It's a possibility. I don't know. It's also possible that the Hellenistic tradition saw the crown of city walls on this Elamite rock relief, and that would have survived. It still survives um, long after the Assyrian stele and palace relief and other imagery, the ceilings, that kind of thing. All of that would have been gone. But I was thinking if, if there is some survival of a true crown, seeing an actual gold crown, maybe even seizing it, that would have had a much more profound ideological impact on the Hellenistic conquerors than seeing something like this to inspire this long, classical tradition then of the crown of mural wall, of city walls. So I bring us back now to our queens who are bona fide Neo-Assyrian queens wearing absolutely certain examples of the crown of city walls. I have um, tried to extend the possible range of our evidence from the third millennium um, into the CE era, um, but it is coming back to these figures that I want to emphasize, even if this, this mural crown truly was um, kind of contained to the Sargonid period, we do still need to consider the roots of where it came from, the deeper significance of it, and that it is a crown not only of queenship, but absolutely of empire. Thank you. Amy, thank you very much indeed. That was a, a, a wonderful journey through um, some, well, some fabulous imagery, of course, but also some exciting possibilities. So uh, thank you very much indeed. And I've no doubt, no doubt at all, lots of, lots of virtual clapping, which is the... Oh. Um, <laughs> The uh, the uh, 
the the unusual thing we we all have got used to um, with with uh, Zoom, but um, well well deserved. Um, thank you. I'm sure your talk has has stimulated all sorts of questions and ideas. So um, so I I welcome everybody um, to turn on their screens if they wish to be seen, and um, we can. Um, uh, begin, I hope, uh, have some time to explore some of these ideas with Amy. Um, I'm, if I may, take advantage of, of uh, as we're hosting this, <laughs> to, to, uh, to launch the questions, because I um, uh, hu hugely um, exciting ideas. I, I mean, it's particularly appropriate given that of course I'm thinking from London where we will have multiple crowns on display tomorrow um, which are indeed passed down generations of course so um, uh, a, a nice sort of reference there but my I want to think about uh, a particular Syrian relief which I, um, I'm sure you um, thought about but this comes from the the throne room of Ashenazipal in the Northwest Palace and one of those reliefs that run along that long wall of the throne room in the lower register shows the return from campaign of the um, the king and his his sort of senior chariots, including the imagery of uh, the divine symbols, and they they are moving in front of a crenellated building. Um, and who is standing on the top of those buildings, clapping madly, but women. And the women are all wearing diadems. And I wonder whether this might be an example of a relationship between women, crenellation, and the king, given your interesting notion of the relationship of queen and king together when the crown appears might fill a gap between the Middle Assyrian and Sargonid period, albeit obviously in a, in a slightly different way, just an idea. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a, that's a really great idea because I don't think it came out of nowhere. If it, if it, you know, it came out of historical or a conceptual tradition, if not a physical artifactual or iconographic tradition and the, the the women being you know it's again women are associated with the palace it's not necessarily that it's the domestic sphere but that is kind of um they they are representatives of the greater households um that they're being passed through that are they're being protected within it um but they're the core of the family women are the core of the empire too as the reproductive core. Great, thank you very much. So there are um, some hands being raised here, some virtual hands. So um, uh, I'll attempt to um, spot everybody, but um, I think uh, Joanne, if you you have your yeah. hand, are you able to? Yeah, very good. Um, and yes, I do, and, and I'll turn. Uh, turn I, I can't hard start my video for some. I can't. Can you hear me? Uh, Hi, Joanne. Hi, hi. Um, I, I have a couple of things. Uh, House is asking you. you to start okay. your video. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. I will do that. Uh, I tried to do that before. Okay. Hello. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. Brava. That, that was wonderful. Um, I have a couple suggestions. Yes, um, please. One of the things is that goddesses that wear crowns, and they are not, that's not all goddesses just wear a crown. The ones that wear a crown are queens of heaven. So in other words, there's an analogy between the human queen as the queen of empire mm -hmm. and the goddess as queen of the empire of the sky, you might say. Mm -hmm. So in other words, that that crown signifies, yes, a kind of universal rulership that in both contexts that you are, you are doing. Okay, now the other thing is, um, I've done, I'm preparing an article actually on the, the, uh, the mural crowns, but, but okay. So, so I'll, I'll give you my, uh, I'll give you a hint, a hint preview, um, of, uh, of part of it anyway. So essentially, um, if you look carefully at the, the word for mural crown, mm -hmm. that is in the Nabonides inscription that you quoted, um, 
is uh, Kulilu, um, which if you look it up in the CAD, you discover there are lots of references to that and there are descriptions of it. They appear in cult inventories because as I said, some god, the, the uh, Ishtar wears one. And the, the two women with the, the crown figures with the, the date palm behind them are almost certainly the queen of heaven. Um, so because of the date palm, you know, that sets one of her symbols is the date palm. So it's the queen of heaven, but the point is it's a queen's crown. It doesn't matter whether it's on a goddess or a human being. And it represents ah, the uh -huh. you want. That universality you want is there. Okay. So the other thing is that if you look at the descriptions and we have quite a few descriptions and the word and you chase it down in the dictionary, which I did, of course, I'm a philologist, I would do that. Um, it goes back to the three period is the earliest represent is the earliest mm. uh, re reference to it. And the thing is they describe them because they're in cult inventories and nothing is ever said about anything resembling a crenellation. They're called a battlement because the word for battlement happens to be the same as that. And it refers to a thing that encircles a city. You might think of it as the battlements or the crown of a city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what they're thinking you know at least I, I think they're thinking in terms of okay so there are no crenellations or whatever on the, any of them there's no description of towers or anything of the sort what there is a description of are simple bands of gold or silver um, and they also talk about being um, decorated with rosettes and with um, rose again circling the head of semi-precious stones. And if you look again at your Nimrod, the, the famous crowns, um, the di your diadem crowns, that's exactly what they are. So you could argue quite simply that yes, there's, okay, A, there's more than one type. In other words, there's simple ones and there are elaborate ones and so forth. There's plenty of room for different types of them. And that those are actually mural crowns in the tombs. And that's what I, I would argue. And I think you're right, they're worn on special occasions and blah, blah, blah. Um, and I think I know what the special occasion is that's putting them in the tombs, but that that's I'll save that for my article. All right. Okay. Get that article out so we can cite it. This is thank you. This is great. Thank you for coming too. Thanks very much indeed. Um, and uh Bianca, Bianca Hand. Yes. Um, sorry. Hi, Bianca. Hi. Um Oh, uh, I'm I'm not able to share my video, but that's okay. Um, that's thank okay. you, Amy, for a wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering what you thought about the association of mural crowns or city models with objects of tribute. Um, like it's a pretty long-standing tradition to depict these um, as tribute objects from uh, foreigners to the king. Um, so I was wondering what you thought about, especially um, in relation to Korsabad and the proliferation of mural crowns um, as tribute objects um, in uh, non-Assyrian procession scenes, um, and also with their kind of heightened association with queens at the same, around the same time, I should say. Well, that could definitely be a stimuli, a stimuli for um, the mural crown, perhaps the crown itself taking that very distinct form of having the articulated towers um, around that same time. Um, I'm. I, it's it's really possible that the um, you know the iconography and of, of that crown was developing, and there's absolutely a connection between. Um, I think between the crown and those city models, because and the city models. I mean, it's it's examples. Those are those are coming from elsewhere, but then so are the queens. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can conflate here. You know, we have um, queens that you know may not be of Assyrian origin. They are coming in. They are they are models of the empire in that they're part of the diversity of the empire. They're part of the display of the range and the power and the beauty of the empire. And that crown that is looking like these city models too is kind of it's I think it would be cueing I mean the people seeing the crown are going to be very familiar with those with those models also so I, I think it's kind of cueing that making the connection showing that the wealth the breadth of empire connecting the queen and person possibly um, her own personal origins to 
um, the origins of some of those city models. I even, I have thought about, you know, and you gotta like go up every road possible. You know, is, is this, is she wearing the crown of, you know, the city of Nineveh? Or does this represent a crown of a conquered city? Or, you know, is it is it just, you know, that's why I'm, I'm thinking of it as a crown of empire, because the empire is, is both and all and everything. Is that helpful yeah, to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very good. Are there any other questions? Uh, um, you aren't able to raise your hand um i think you know simply simply speak <laughs> if you can un unmute yourself that should be possible i'm hoping that everyone can also now show I their saw video should richard's they... hand up but it went away was that yeah i took it down okay it was okay. Still off after my oh, question okay <laughs> so okay i took it down that's okay that's what happened yeah Oh, by the way, just um, I would suggest another suggestion I forgot to mention when I was yes. up again, um, is that the representation as walls is iconographic. Mm -hmm. Then in other words, that the real crowns never actually looked like that. In other words, it's a symbolic crown. And it, it has all the connotations you're talking about, you know, cities and, and empires and all this sort of stuff redolent with it. But it's shown in that way as a, because, I mean, the word is the same. The word for the crown and the word for the battlements are identical. That It's the same word, clearly. Even the CAD puts them together. It doesn't have two separate words. Um, so anyway, you, uh, that it, it's an iconographic representation, a symbolic, you might say, an iconographic representation of the actual crowns that you're looking at. Okay, that, 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 sorry. I, I've, 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 oh, yeah. Thank you. There's something in the sh in the chat. Good, thank you. Okay, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So, um, question: the publication on the Nimrud Queens will it be a book or an article? When will it be published, approximately? And the exact topic. So, so more more opportunities to publish uh, to publicize the forthcoming book okay so um my my book is almost done i'm i'm working on the last chapter <laughs> so it, it will be done as soon as as that gets done um but you know it's a manuscript so it has to go through publication it's in contract with oxford university press and it is preliminarily titled you know something along the lines of the queens of nimrud's northwest palace beauty power and presence i have a chapter in that book um, about the iconography of queenship and i have a chapter about the archaeological materials um, that were found in the tombs of the northwest palace so um neither of those you know deal like really dig into the mural crown as as much as i hope to go further um in a separate article in the future um probably an article that will come out after joanne's research comes out that um you know any anything any any new research that's being done on mural crowns i'm gonna you know, have my antennas up for, um, but that's a, a future publication specifically on the mural crown that I'm so excited to be able to dig into. But I'm I'm really just kind of pulling pulling the evidence together and and trying to sort it out by way of talking um, with friends and colleagues like I am here. Fantastic, and uh, and a, a comment from from Alison Thomason. Um, thanks, Amy. Anticipating another quote, crowning ceremony um, tomorrow with a crown of empire. I'm not sure about the empire a bit, but um, um, certainly a crown. <laughs> well, that's maybe how the, the Koh -i -Noor, the one with the koh -i -Noor diamond. That's what I was thinking. But anyway. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, if there are no more um, questions for Amy, um, uh, allow me again to, to thank her on your behalf and certainly from me for uh, a wonderful talk, um, you know, stimulating ideas, much to think about and, and 
much to 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 work on for sure so amy thank you very much indeed and of course we we await your publication um uh, of the book um eagerly and if i may take everyone's uh, the opportunity to remind everybody that you know, amy's talk was the first in the series we having uh, one nearly every week over the next uh, couple of months um, I, uh, our next speaker will be Michael Seymour from the Metropolitan Museum, who will be talking on appropriately, given the, the family connections, the prints, uh, human and object biographies in an Assyrian uh, relief fragment. Uh, normally we'd be advertising these talks through the Agaday list, but um, the list is currently on pause for a few weeks, so uh, please do um, put this in your diary. Um, for next week, next Friday, exactly the same time um, when I look forward to welcome you all back um, uh, as part of this Archaeology in Action series. So my, again, my thanks to, to Amy and to all of you and um, have a very good week. Thank you. Um, and we need the exactly. Zoom link. How do we get the Zoom link? The, the Zoom link will be exactly the same one as you used to get in today. So yes. just retain okay. that and right. um, okay. you'll be uh, able to get in. But good. Good, good, good question, good. important one. Yeah. Um, very good. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs> okay great well thank you paul so much indeed no that was brilliant it was wonderful thank you and, um, thank you it was a great opportunity so yeah. um, it was I wonderful guess... <laughs> it was absolutely wonderful this is joanne <laughs> speaking uh, under, under the alias of richard peel speaking of iconographic representations anyway yeah that, that right. was wonderful. it's nice right. have, have we actually seen each other before in person in person like, yeah yeah, it, like 10 years ago. Okay, all right. <laughs> anyway, so I give you a virtual hug. How's that? Oh, I'll accept that. And and back to back to you all. So okay. have a great weekend and maybe we'll, I'll be in the audience next Friday. Perfect. Look forward to that. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.